Um, Jana Rogers is professor and undergraduate director uh, in the women, Women's and Gender Studies Department at Rutgers University. She's an economist by training uh, and in practice, <laughs> of course. Uh, she has a bachelor's in economics from Cornell University and a PhD from Harvard University. Um, much of her research is focused on East Asia and South Asian economies, and she has traveled to and lived in uh, Asia to conduct her research. Um, she has published numerous articles in economics journals and also has a, has a book, Maternal Employment and Child Health, Global Issues and Policy Solutions, published by Edward Elgar. Um, she and I, of course, have co-authored some articles on international trade and uh, gender wage gaps and working conditions in some Asian economies. Um, uh, Professor Rogers served as president of the International Association for Feminist Economics in 2013-2014, and she had, she is, uh, she has served as associate editor of the journal Feminist Economics since 2005. Um, she has also worked regularly as a for the World Bank, the United Nations, and Asian Development Bank. And uh, last but not least, <laughs> uh, she's an avid runner and enjoys racing, and especially half marathons, and, and she's actually going to be running in a half marathon in Salt Lake City tomorrow morning. <laughs> and <laughs> so you may go to the finish line and <laughs> cheer her on. <laughs> and, uh, without further ado, um, in terms of uh, it, in terms of the, our format, uh, she's going to obviously make a presentation and take questions at the end. But if there are any clarifying questions, clarification questions, please don't hesitate to uh, ask. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm trying to do a half marathon in every state, so tomorrow I can add Utah to the list, assuming that I finish. That's the goal. Um, so this paper is Child Labor and Changes in the Minimum Wage, Evans from India, and it is co-authored with one of my um, other main co-authors, besides uh, Prinsley, uh, Nidia Menon. And just for the, the women grad students in the room, a little aside, um, I met Nidia first about 12 years ago at a mentoring workshop organized by the Committee on the Status of Women in the Economics Profession, CSWEP. And they still have these workshops. And Nidia was one of my mentees uh, as a very young junior faculty member, and I was a mentor. And shortly after the workshop, she contacted me, and um, we've been writing together ever since as co, you know, co-authors and equals. Uh, but it's been a hugely productive relationship, and we met because of CSWEP. So for those of you, um, you know, who are familiar with CSWEP, I would encourage you to try some of their workshops. Okay, so um, as you'll um, surely know already, and we'll hear, I guess, soon uh, Bellman, I hear, is coming to your department also to talk about minimum wages. Uh, there's been a, a huge surge of interest in the impact of the minimum wage uh, globally, and uh, there's been so many studies in the U.S. that Bellman and his co-author um, did a meta-analysis to find out, well, what exactly know, is, is there a convergence in some of these estimates? And they concluded that, um, you know, across studies in the U.S. and industrialized countries, there probably is a very, very small disemployment effect from um, imposing minimum wages or raising them, but very small and usually statistically insignificant. Um, similar in uh, developing countries, uh, very small disemployment effects. Um, usually, again, statistically insignificant. If there are some, and if they're done by gender, sometimes a little bigger disemployment effects for women. Um, in developing countries, often studies of the minimum wage are done in a broader context of um, regulations in the labor market. And a typical you know, set of findings is that countries with heavier regulations in the labor market um, tend to have bigger informal sectors, perhaps slower growth, more unemployment. Um, and virtually all these studies have looked at 
adult minimum wages or people of prime working age, um, often starting at ages 15 and up. Um, although uh, children uh, can easily be affected by the minimum wage, um, and the impact, as we'll see later, can go either way. So it's a really uh, an empirical question, uh, which is why we'd like to ask that question. What is the impact of the minimum wage for adults on the use of child labor? And uh, we are using data from India to ask that question. Um, India, I think, is a great case study for that question because it has a very large child wage force. Uh, more than 4 million children in India are employed. It's more than any other country. Um, and you know, regionally, uh, some of India's neighbors, uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, already have very high rates of child labor. Um, India is also interesting because each of its states um, has autonomy in setting its own labor market regulations, including the minimum wage. And India has been the subject of lots of studies, looking labor studies, uh, labor market analyses, looking at the impact of all these regulations, because it's had quite a restrictive, if you want to start using labels, um, regulatory regime. And several authors have blamed that regulatory environment on slower productivity growth, slower output, on more unemployment. And there is, uh, even though nobody, as far as we can tell or have looked or have found, no one has empirically estimated the impact of the minimum wage on child labor, there is um, a growing literature, empirical literature, on the determinants of child labor, looking at, say, household income, uh, children's human capital, uh, economic shocks. And that literature is reviewed in the paper. Uh, just a couple of the studies that we have found a little more recently, um, children are less likely to work if they have higher measures of their own human capital and if they live in wealthier households. Um, closely related, when market wages go up for low-skill, low-earnings parents, um, that's associated with a decline in the demand for child labor. And then um, another interesting paper, uh, paradoxically, when India banned child labor in 1986, uh, child labor actually went up because the ban caused the wages for children to fall and households living uh, below poverty needed to actually put more children to work in order to meet their subsistence needs. So that's a brief um, introduction to the paper in terms of the conceptual underpinnings. Um, most people are very familiar with the textbook effects of raising the minimum wage. It's uh, predicted to cause a decline in demand for adult uh, workers, and uh, jobs become relatively scarce, so some workers theoretically may be displaced. Um, in developing countries and in transition economies, often the displacement happens uh, through a sectoral shift and workers go into the informal sector. Um, these effects can be large if the minimum wage is set to a level that's substantially above the market clearing rate. Um, and most of this modeling has been for adult workers. Uh, but there is um, also a bit of theoretical work on how child labor may be affected. And the um, main person doing this theoretical work is Kaushik Basu. And um, we don't remodel his model, but just a basic summary is that uh, his 2000 paper has um, a model in which there are multiple equilibrium uh, if you think about the impact of raising the minimum wage on child labor. And it's set in a context in which parents um, are altruistic. They would like their children to be in school, but they do send their children to work if um, necessary for uh, maintaining a subsistence level of consumption. Um, so in one kind of equilibrium, a good equilibrium, 
uh, the minimum wage is set uh, sufficiently high so that children do not need to work and they can go to school. Um, the bad equilibrium is when the adult minimum wage is too low and households need to um, contribute or supplement the adult income coming in with the income from child workers. Um, and there's other equilibria um, as governments try to set the appropriate minimum wage and try to move from a bad <coughs> equilibrium to a good one, and if they miss the mark, um, that could lead to, let's say, disemployment effects for adult workers, and again, the need for children to step in. Um, so that's a brief, very brief overview of Basu's model, which we use to motivate our empirical work, and this is very much an empirical paper. So we just have one um, basic uh, regression equation where we model um, child employment as a function of the minimum wage, and then a large number of household and child productivity characteristics. Um, P is a variable for some state indicators I'll talk about. And then uh, we have a number of fixed effects, fixed effects by state, fixed effects by year, and the interaction between state and year. Uh, one thing that we grappled with where we ended up turning to the literature on child labor is how to define employment. Um, and in the data set that we use, there is a, actually two measures of the principal activity. And um, we followed the literature on child labor and used as our definition of uh, whether or not a child is employed is if their principal activity status in the past week they're considered their current status. Um, if they're an only count worker, an employer, an unpaid family worker, a wage employee, casual wage laborer, some other type of worker, uh, if they do primarily domestic work, if they're in school um, but have positive cash earnings. So that is a pretty broad definition, but it's consistent with what previous studies have done. robustness test, there is another in the data. We do have um, principal activity status, uh, the usual principal activity status of the past year, and we do robustness checks where um, the, the responses for that variable are the same, and then we try both to see if, and the results are very similar. Yeah, um, and this pluses and minuses. Somebody actually wrote a whole paper on what's better, currents or usual, um, and the advantage of using Current is that there's less bias from memory problems, not quite remembering, mm -hmm. uh, but we do a robustness check. So just a clarifying question. So if they are in school, but they work as well at home as unpaid family members, so they, they would not be counted as employed? Now this is uh, the principal activity. So if their principal activity is domestic work, uh, if that's how um, a respondent classified their child, then they would be, if the principal activity is domestic work, then they are counted as employed. If their principal activity is student, they are not considered employed unless they earn positive cash earnings. And there's not that many children who are in school and earn positive cash earnings. But if they did, well, they, they could consider be them employed. They could be in school and work on the farm as well. They could, but then it depends on how the respondent of the survey answered is their principal activity. Yes? Is it possible to have a bias um, in reporting of child labor? Because the reporting is done by the households in the survey. Yes. So if households perceive child labor as a bad thing already, they, is it possible that house, some households might report the primary activity of their child as going to school, schooling, mm -hmm. although they are doing primarily household work? Uh, yes, that would be entirely possible. I think one thing we have going for us is that the data set is one of the best in India. It's been around for quite a while. So presumably, um, the people conducting the surveys are trained in trying to reduce that kind of bias. Um, but yes, if a, a, a respondent feels like they have something to hide, of course, uh, they could. All right. 
Um, so these are the other variables um, that I mentioned. And um, at the state level, these other indicators that we're using are net real domestic product, um, unemployment rates by state. Uh, we have some data on how the minimum wage is enforced by state, and also the regulatory environment in every state. Okay, and then the fixed effects, again, are for the state, the year, and these interactions. And these are all designed to control the la local labor market conditions. And this data set, it's a huge, uh, the NSSO, and we have six waves of the data. And we are keeping as our sample, once we've constructed all the household level variables, and for that <coughs> the data on every member of the household, but for the actual regressions, our sample is children, ages 5 to 14. And altogether, in the six years of data, we have close to 900,000 observations. So it's a pretty large data set. Okay, where most of the work came in, and I'm Betting for the, the grad students in the room doing empirical work, you're probably finding this already. If someone tells you it's going to take you X amount of time to do empirical work, it's really X cubed. Um, <laughs> that's what happened with this work. Most of the work went into merging minimum wage data into the NSSO employment data. Uh, the minimum wage data is separate. And um, the key word in the top line is electronic. So we actually created a new electronic database on minimum wages across these years um, and across states for India. Um, and it's, uh, it varies by state, by year, and also by detailed job category. So every state in India sets its own minimum wages, but they have lots of minimum wages, with very detailed categories. And the level of detail differs by state, too. Uh, so, for example, one state had such detailed categories like elephant handler and umbrella maker, um, and they all have different minimum wages. So, um, you know, we get more than a thousand different rates across India in a given year. And uh, on average, uh, once we aggregate up a little bit, and we see some of the trends, minimum wage rates are higher in construction, mining, and services lower in agriculture. And we got our data from a set of reports. Um, and you see the title on the screen. And in subsequent years, they were PDF reports that are available online. Uh, but the first three waves of our data, the reports were not online. So we uh, got through a faculty member at Rutgers. His contact worked in Delhi. He went to some dusty office in Delhi and photocopied books, big books, of these minimum wage reports and sent them via DHL um, to Nydia. And she, in turn, um, uh, scanned them as PDF files. And then we thought, OK, using the Adobe Converter, maybe we can convert from PDF now into some sort of Word document that we could then import into Excel and then into Stata. But the quality of the copies wasn't that good. It was all gibberish. So we ended up having to hire grad students to retype all of these job categories into Excel. And it took several months of work. So that's why this word electronic database is key. And you literally went from <coughs> pages in India to having this database to merge into the employment database. Uh, Ira Gang in the economics department. Yeah. Okay, and some other merges that we did with these other state level um, sets of indicators, uh, state domestic product, unemployment rates. Uh, the Dusty reports also had uh, data on enforcement of the minimum wage, uh, the number of inspections that were made, the number of irregularities that they found, the number of cases when they were fined, when they found uh, violations, and then uh, the total real value of the fines. Okay, and then this regulatory environment. So each of these groups of variables covered 15 states 
over six years. I'm going to say just a little bit more about each one. Um, so those of you who know India, these, these are the 15 states, and roughly the states with the highest um, net domestic product in 1983 tended to have the highest net domestic product in 2008. So that was merged in. Um, for the regulatory environment, uh, we took some data that we had used in an earlier paper um, for India, where we converted legal documents on regulations, labor regulations, into numerical variables. Um, and there were two variables uh, we called adjustment and disputes. So the adjustment uh, variable looks at legislation that makes it uh, easier or more difficult for firms to hire and fire workers uh, when there's changing business conditions. So we call that adjustment. And the disputes variable looks at regulations that makes it easier or more difficult for workers to go on strike or to um, have some other kind of a dispute. Okay, so these were all coded numerically and um, the, uh, the original legislative data came from, we contacted these two authors, they had a paper about this, and um, in every year that a particular legal code was changed, if it strengthened workers' power, it was pro-worker, it got a plus one, if it strengthened employers' power, it got a minus one. If there was no change in a particular year, it got a zero. So, yes, um, Norm. So, you, got a, uh, you mentioned earlier on about this uh, child labor law. Yes. And it doesn't seem to appear here in any of your regulatory or labor uh, market uh, law enforcement facets of your analysis. Uh -huh. And it would seem as though that part of the employment of children would depend to some extent, on how yeah. stiff you're going to enforce this law. That, that's the key word, enforcement. Yeah, and so, so... The enforcement of the child ban was close to non-existent. It didn't vary across the states? And we don't have data. We only had data on the enforcement of the minimum wage. We did not have data on the enforcement of the child labor ban. So what we're getting at now, we have these variables for enforcement of the adult minimum wage and then this regulatory environment. That's unfortunate, isn't it? It's very unfortunate. Yeah, but anecdotal evidence, and perhaps we can add that in, indicates that the child labor ban was not enforced very well. Across. Across. But I, I will show you a momentarily descriptive statistics that child labor fell over time but we don't know if it was due to economic reasons or due to the ban, but it did fall over time. Yes? Just a related uh, question. I mean, could it be that, that states decide, let's, let's try and force uh, child labor laws, and, and, and uh, I mean, and the reason that that will lead to families having lower incomes, so we need to also raise minimum wages to compensate for loss of income. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the reason for why there's a change in the minimum wage laws is might maybe because they they are starting to enforce child labor laws. Is, is it possible that That's, you're saying this? Whole, I think so? that might be possible. Yes, I, I'm standing here offhand. I could not refute that. Um, so some of that might be going on. Okay, so um, here's just a, a two graphs showing these other regulatory environment variables. This shows in general any legal changes uh, for adjusting the size of the workforce tended to be in the pro-worker direction for states that had changes. And changes in legal codes having to do with industrial disputes tended to favor the employers and be in a pro-employer direction. Okay, so, yes. I would think that the Kerala, for example, mm -hmm. 
children's educational attainment, we did not look at the determinants of children's educational attainment, nor did we directly estimate the impact of the ban, because that earlier paper in the Lit Review had already estimated the impact of the ban, and they found that child labor actually increased. Um, so we took that as our own evidence that this child labor ban was not really being enforced if child labor actually increased after the um, so what we are interested, what our dependent variable is child employment rather than children's school enrollment rates. Others in the literature have looked at children's school enrollment uh, when they look at child labor, and that's perhaps something that we can do as you know a separate section of the paper. We haven't done that yet. Yes, Lindsay. Um, so there was this consensus I remember in the 1990s that. Uh, to move towards policy of um, having part-time schooling and part-time child in order mm -hmm. to combat child labor. Does yeah. India have any, uh, do they implement any such programs such that we may have child labor increasing because they're implementing these programs to attend school as well as continue work? Yeah. That's a good question. I think what I've seen in this legislative set of laws can pass on child labor is that they tend, child labor is banned in particular occupational industrial categories rather than the amount of time spent at work. It's in these particular categories that are deemed as dangerous for children. So, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright, so the approach for, now that we're, I've told you all about our control variables, the regression approach I'm going to work our way through first some descriptive statistics looking at child labor and how it varies by gender, age, um, rural, urban, expenditure quintiles. And then we'll look at what these children are actually doing and how that varies by gender. And then the distribution of minimum wages across states. And then also uh, looking first descriptively at the bivariate association between child labor and the minimum wage, and then finally the regression, or the full regression results. Okay, so this is a set of bar graphs looking at the incidence of child labor by age, by gender, by year, and then urban rural. So the top left hand corner is 1983, 1988, 94, 2000, 2005, 2008. The blue bars are for boys, the red bars are for girls, and on the left of each graph is the urban sector, on the right is the rural sector. Okay, so we can see that generally child labor incidence is higher for girls, it's higher in the rural sector, it's higher for children who are ages 10 to 14 as compared to children who are ages 5 to 9. And it has fallen considerably since 1983. Okay, so that's pretty clear from the, yes? Is that proportion children to adults? No. This is children ages 5 to 14 who are employed um, as a percentage of all children okay. ages 5 to 14. Good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, a similar set of bar graphs done by expenditure quintiles. Um, and it shows, as one would think, that children in poorer households that spend less tend to um, have tend to work more. <coughs> the incidence of child labor is higher for households in very low expenditure quintiles. And as you get into higher expenditure households, child labor goes down. And again, you can see the higher rates for girls compared to boys, and the decrease in child labor over time. The main point here is that child labor goes down as countries, as um, households are wealthier or can spend more. And we also looked at what these children who are working, um, where you know, work is their primary activity, what they're doing, and how that varies for girls and boys. So this is that primary activity. 
activity status variable, and the numbers are very similar. This is using current activity, very similar if we use usual activity. And girls are primarily um, domestic helpers, where they're either doing just domestic work, or they're also doing domestic work and collecting water and fuel. That was a separate um, code in this, or separate response, you want them together. Uh, but basically, I'm doing domestic work in the home um, for collecting uh, fuel and water. And boys are primarily um, working in household enterprises of some kind, and they also have higher rates of being casual workers and wage employees um, compared to girls. Uh, yes? Where does the <coughs> farming business, if I don't know how that's defined um, in, the, in the data, but how, where does the, a, a child working for the farming business fall? Is, is it counted as a domestic helper? Or no, it would be household, household enterprise. enterprise. Okay. Um, next, we just looked at, uh, again, probably most interest to people who know India and other different states. These are the nominal minimum wages in 2008, the year, the most recent year, and how they vary across the states. Uh, we did, for the purposes of the merge, given all these thousands of different categories, we did some aggregation to facilitate the merge, because the industrial job categories in the NSSO are different from the minimum wage reports, so we did aggregate up to facilitate the merge, and these are the five categories that we used for the um, merging. Agriculture, mining, construction, services, and manufacturing. And those of you not familiar with India, in 2008 the exchange rate was roughly 44 rupees per dollar, and these are daily minimum wages. So for example, in West Bengal, this would at 44 rupees dollar be around um, three dollars per day roughly in manufacturing. So is there a minimum wage for unorganized workers as well? Um, in India the minimum wage is by job category regardless of if it's informal sector or formal sector it's by job category. That's a good question. Okay, we converted it into real terms also to see uh, what have been changes over time and anything highlighted in green is a state that has seen a decline in the real minimum wage over time. So most states over time had increases in the real minimum wage, uh, several states had decreases over time. Yes, do you have any
California, Utah, by deflating our own price level here and deflating it nationally, it's not going to get there in terms of the, what it costs to live here versus the real wage in Utah versus California. Should we not to some extent be captured by your state side of the interactions? Yeah, because we have all these other, those, the dummy interactions as well as all the other controls at the state level. I think that would be capturing it. But if not, if you have a suggestion on how else to do it, just benchmark it on the average, on an average uh, rent or an average uh, something in the uh, in the area might be interesting. Okay. Uh, it's an interesting question as to whether that fixed. I mean, so de simply rent. using deflators is not good yeah. enough. No. 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 State deflators. No. no. no.
this is with a slew of other independent variables on individual characteristics, household characteristics, and all those other variables I talked about. And what we find is a positive impact of the minimum wage on boys, child labor, in rural areas. And it's pretty big, so 10% increase in the minimum wage, boys' employment probability increases by 15%. And in urban areas, it's in the other direction. So their child labor is falling by um, almost 14%. Um, similar for girls, an increase in the rural sector, uh, almost the same magnitude, a little bit smaller. Girls' employment goes up by about 14% with an increase in the minimum wage. In urban areas, <coughs> their employment also goes down, like boys, but it's only weekly, statistically significant. It's at around 11 or 12%. So it doesn't quite make the 10% benchmark. Maybe explain it, but could you please repeat how you got that one minimum wage value from the different industries? Oh, um, the kernel densities? No, because no. you, you showed a table how the minimum wage varied across different industries in different states. Oh, okay, Here that's like you the, have one this minimum one. wage in the regression. <coughs> so, for example, it's one minimum wage in agriculture, mining, construction services, so on. Oh, so we oh. had five minimum wage rates for each state in every year. That was the level of aggregation. So, but when you're under regression, you only have one minimum wage? No, no five, five. five. Okay. Yeah. So, which minimum wage is it? So, generally, when the, the direction of when the minimum wage goes up on average, so oh. when the average minimum wage across the five categories goes up, but the merging into the employment database happened uh, at this aggregated level. That's how we did the merge, to match the minimum wage with each person. So each person reported an industry. Oh, okay. And okay, those yeah. in industrial categories in the NSSO are not the same as the industrial categories in those dusty reports. So that's why we aggregated up in order to do the merge. But five sectors. Five sectors. So that's boys and that's girls. And then here you can just see them uh, numerically. I just picked off from each regression. So we did four regressions so far. Um, I should say this is brand new work, and maybe this is TMI, too much information. Um, we were doing this Wednesday morning, right before. So most of the paper was all written up until the, the tables with the regression results, and because we were running regressions all weekend, Monday morning, Tuesday. And this was the set we settled on Wednesday morning, right before I left for the airport. Um, so we are, this is new work, and I'm very happy to take uh, suggestions for where else this can go, um, and like questions like uh, why are states changing their minimum wage or these adjustments for cost of living. So you can see the positive effect in the rural sector, negative effect in the urban sector, not statistically significant for girls. Again, the probability value is about 12%, so it doesn't quite make the 10% cutoff. This yes. question on the, on the previous one. If, I mean, if, because you read two regression, one separate for boys, one separate for girls. If and then you, urban and rural are separate also. Okay. So, but if you would pull the urban sector boys and girls into one regression, not in interaction terms, would you really be able to say that the girl effect is statistically significantly different from the boys effect? Because if you look at the you know, confidence intervals, mm -hmm. the girls' coefficient definitely falls within the boys' coefficient interval. Yeah. So, even though you know separately the, the girls' coefficient seems to be statistically insignificant, it would be interesting to, you know, if you got one regression, try the interaction, so there's sure. actually a difference. Yeah, so that it could be because there's, I think the sample size for the girls is smaller, it could just be a reflection yeah, exactly. of a smaller number of girls in the sample. Yeah. Especially once we get into the girls in the urban sector, that could just be the smaller sample. Uh, yes, <coughs> Across industries, do minimum wages change in tandem? Is it possible that you know, at one point construction is higher than manufacturing and in the next period in the same state, manufacturing minimum wage is higher than the construction? 
Do those switches happen? Yeah, um, I think the, from year to year, we haven't looked at that. What the one slide I had at the beginning year and the end year. So to answer your question, I'd have to go back and make the table where we have every single year and look at it more closely. I don't remember exactly looking at your question. There is, I was yeah. curious about the inter-industry laws of employment. Oh, okay. What was going, if anything is going on. Yeah. Uh, I think one question we've had to address um, is if workers are selecting into industries because of the minimum wage, the adult workers, right. and probably the answer, at least by state, that they're not selecting into states with higher minimum wages is that there's been other research done in India showing that cross-state migration in India is very low. So that would at least help us to address the selection by state as to whether people select across industries to get a higher wage. We would hope that that would get captured by our other control variables for their, say, education especially, and other characteristics. But there could still be some selection happening across industries if it's not getting picked up by our other control variables. So in closing, I've got two slides uh, just summarizing uh, what we find, what we found. Again, child labor in India is higher for girls and for boys. It is uh, higher for the older children between ages 10 and 14 um, compared to younger children. It's higher in rural areas. It is higher for children in poor households, and it has fallen substantially over time. Uh, we also saw descriptively that girl child workers are predominantly doing domestic work, while boy child workers are predominantly doing uh, household enterprise work, probably farming, as Monica brought up earlier. Um, over time, we've seen most states have an increase in the real minimum wage, and then compliance with the minimum wage seems to have improved over time, especially for male adults. And the regression results show that regardless of gender, the minimum wage is leading to an increase in child labor in rural areas and a decrease in child labor in um, urban areas where the urban effect we are capturing is a bit stronger for boys and girls in terms of the precision of the estimate. So linking it back to that conceptual framework in Kaushik Basu's model, um, it seems to be that there's some sort of a bad equilibrium going on in the rural sector. So families uh, need their children to be working, uh, whereas in urban areas, um, when there are higher minimum wages and adults are increasing their own income, there's less of a need for children to um, be employed and rather go to school. Uh, yes, I'm on Uh, that's all I have. I think the detailed paper um, has all of the variables, including the enforcement variables of the adult minimum wage. And from what I remember, there was no clear pattern in those variables across boys and girls, urban, rural. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes negative. Uh, it seems to me that the kind of results you are getting is telling a story about enforcement. And, uh, kind of counterintuitive if you know how India works mm -hmm. that enforcement, it seems that enforcement in rural areas is higher that's generating this effect. Enforcement or, of what? Minimum mm -hmm. wage. Enforcement of the adult minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't seem to be very intuitive. Yeah. Uh, what's the enforcement story? Yeah. I would say probably in the more recent years the enforcement story would be the <coughs> the exact name, the um, guaranteed employment, the national yeah, guaranteed employment, employment guarantee, guarantee yeah. uh, scheme, which was uh, pretty much a way of enforcing the minimum wage because it's legislative guaranteed employment um, at at least the minimum wage. So that would be more or less the enforcement in the rural sector in later years. Uh, so there are two different enforcement issues. One is the minimum wage, and other is Yes, implemented whatever I'm into. 
those of you who know India, you know, may know something about the, the states with the high um, net state domestic product. Um, we also did not look at child labor rates by uh, state. I guess that would be similar to do descriptively. Mm -hmm. Any data that are available on um, schooling in terms of infrastructure, uh, how long they would have to walk to the school, or things that would give us an idea of how available schooling is. Yeah. The NSSO so just has educational attainment. It does not have distance to the school. Thank you. 
wasn't extended to the no. whole. It's, 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 it remains rural, and this was like 40 million times so it was quite mm -hmm. large numbers of people involved in it. Uh, and I, so that's and 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 do you have any uh, breaking the data before the program versus the like the time effect? What you would see in terms of the time effects? Yeah, we did not attempt to control okay. explicitly for that um, particular act. So that, I think it was in 2004, is that yes. right, Samantha? I think it was. But certain states adopted, uh, implemented okay. it, sorry, is implemented it, it at different points of time. It was Probably these two years years the after the act and the other 40 years before, yeah. roughly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, my, mm -hmm. my recollection is that it was piloted first in some states and then it became Implementation and enforcement of that is very bad if those who are focusing on the implementation of that program is not uniform across states. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So one may get a sense of the differences, at least in the rural areas, in terms of enforcement, with some proxies about when, at least when the program was adopted and, okay. and so on. Uh, so that may give you some variation. Mm -hmm. Um, and then with regard to the rural story, um, I, I know and I, 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 I am, uh, and I know there's no good data to come, to, to, to come up with, I understand the problem of data, but the reference period is, because even when they say it's primary activity, mm -hmm. I mean in rural areas, not only in India, but all over the world in rural areas, children, Yeah, we don't have that 
specific variable, but we do have variables in there for number of adults working in the household. Number of, I think we exactly included number of adults working for wages in the household. In the household. Yeah. But you don't have police. Uh, we don't know if it's because of if it was because of this scheme. No one but there. So mm -hmm. there's no data on the effects of the employment guarantee program by um, you know, I haven't household seen it. or tracking no. all this. There have been papers looking specifically right. at that, but I haven't read them closely enough to see what data there is. They have a household yeah. level data. Yeah. Because then they might, mm -hmm. yeah. they might, that might, yeah. I'm just thinking that might be maybe the explanation in the rural mm -hmm. case, but why wouldn't that happen in the urban case? I mean, it's not so easy for children to urban work and there might be more enforcement of dangerous and hazardous kinds of work in, maybe in, in urban areas. In urban areas. It's easier to monitor. Easier to monitor. Yep. Yep. Uh, you reminded me, uh, I didn't talk much about the other control variables, but one that came out strongly across sectors and across gender of the child is the education of the household head. Mm -hmm. So that one was large, substantively, and very strongly statistically significant in terms of um, higher education for household head means less likelihood that children are working, very consistently so. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? Hi, I think the, the, the rollover record, too, about the beginning of the month of February, it's based on the, that the family income can't afford the, the children to go to school. Mm -hmm. So then who indicates that the the calls are rather to be the in a primary model. So I think that was related to the earlier comment about distance to school. Yeah, so yeah, just yeah, how distance, accessible is schooling yeah. financially or distance wise. But distance is uh -huh. like something we can overcome, but the, the monetary terms is like how much is spent or the yeah. cost of school. It's because you know in China the same story mm -hmm. goes on. It's like the family will mm -hmm argues that we don't have money for the to afford children to go to school and uh, if they don't go to work they are nothing so we send them to go to work it's mm -hmm. better than nothing so at, this, at some extreme points it's like okay they go to work they can't eat a meal they eat, eat meat every month mm -hmm. so if they live in a family you know they got they can't eat meat for, eat meat for the whole year so that their like holidays in Peru but I, I think that's a very direct concern when the parents make their decisions on whether to yeah. send their children to school. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good comment. We were actually debating on, we do have the, we don't have in the employment unemployment module of the NSSL, we don't have detailed expenditure data, but we do have total household per capita expenditures. So that's how we constructed the quintiles. Uh, but we did that for the descriptive analysis. We were debating, do we include expenditure quintiles as a control variable in the regressions. And I thought, no, because part of the expenditures on a, for an average household would be determined simultaneously with if the child is working or not. So we decided not to include per capita expenditures by quintile. But maybe we should. But I'm not so sure if it's completely exogenous. I think that the key point is that some comparisons between the the, their, their income and the house, uh, the school costs is like a term, I think it's a determined cost yeah. by your daily sanction to mm -hmm. education. And if we can get some sort of education cost by state, that would be exogenous as opposed to what households are spending. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. That's, that's mm -hmm. a good suggestion. You've had your hand up. Yeah, uh, investments and disinvestment in certain industries and states um, should cause shock to, to that the industry and states. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, do, do you address that by, I mean, I, I think it's state dummies. We don't have no, any but, direct data. But I'm not talking about the standards. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you cluster on like state industry level? Shouldn't that uh, make sense? We clustered by state, I think. It's in one of the footnotes of the paper. Uh, we did, I believe we clustered by state. I, I, maybe, you know, I, I thought when you mentioned investment, I think it was about well, this investment seems like mm -hmm. maybe it's, you know, you never know which is the correct level of trust or not, but maybe state industry makes more sense than a state to, because, I mean, that's, 
that should cause a shock. Well, that's a good idea. Okay. So instead of just clustering by state, cluster by state and. Because also, I mean, state you only have 15 groups and mm -hmm. usually that's quite a small number of groups to yeah. cluster on the state industries you want to put in. Like five. Uh -huh. so, that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Really good suggestions. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh.